So allow me to introduce Dr. Mark Hout as our uh, speaker today. Mark is uh, director of the neuropsychology program at West Virginia University. Uh, he has uh, been a wonderful colleague of mine during my time at West Virginia University, and uh, we're, we're very pleased that he's able to join us today and present uh, his talk that we're all um, very curious to understand, but uh, I'm sure that'll become abundantly clear during this hour. So, Mark, welcome to University of Louisville. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bowling, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and talk with you guys. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about brain plasticity today um, and primarily how it's measured in adults using MRI techniques. Um, I have to just take a second to mention, I'm sorry you guys lost last week. I was pulling for Louisville when West Virginia was still in the uh, Big East. One of the things I loved about it was no matter how bad we were, which sometimes we were, we always had really great teams come in and play at our Coliseum. So I always got to see great basketball, even if we were bad. And Louisville was definitely one of those teams that I got to see, but no more. So uh, a couple of acknowledgments. In particular, I want to thank Dr. Frick, who's the chairman of radiology at West Virginia University, for over the years giving me access initially to the PET scanner that he brought there and then the MRI machines that we have. And then I have a variety of collaborators who've helped me with some of the research that I'll present. Uh, Dr. Smith, who was a medical student at the time, helped kind of get some of this stuff going in particular. Um, and uh, I want to mention Darren Kobe in particular, who's at Northwestern now, who helped me with some of the more recent analysis I've been doing. Conflicts, the only conflicts I have are really about my mother. Um, I don't have any vested interest in anything that I'm trying to sell to you today other than some interesting science. I have some funding through NIH uh, with Dr. Catherine Budafish that looks at plasticity and uh, stroke. Unfortunately, we're still analyzing that data, so I won't be able to present any of it today. So here's the real question. Can we really grow our brains and change our brains? And I hope to present some information to you guys today that will convince you that we can to some degree. So a little bit of an outline here for you. We're going to talk about some of the original studies that were done in this area. And the reason for the title is they were done with taxi drivers and jugglers, which always kind of caught my interest. We're going to talk about the time frame for how quickly we can measure changes in the brain structure using MRI techniques, a little bit about what we're actually changing, and then we're going to talk about an attention training study we've been working on. So for years, you know, when I was in school many years ago, 25, 30 years ago, when we talked about plasticity, we only talked about it in children. We thought children had plastic brains. If they had an injury early enough, their brain could adjust and adapt and be plastic. Mainly came from early injuries to the left hemisphere in children, <clears throat> their language still developed despite the fact the left hemisphere was damaged and often moved to the left, left hemisphere. We didn't think there was plasticity in adults at all. We thought that for adults, once you hit adulthood, your brain was done and it was actually all downhill from there. The only thing that happened is you lost tissue over time. Now, the first study that really caught my interest with that, and I remember when this was published, and I presented it in the Neuroimaging Journal Club at West Virginia back in 2000. Uh, Dr. McGuire had been studying London taxi drivers. And to be a taxi driver in London, you have to learn this very, very complex spatial map. And it took a lot of skill, and not everybody could do it. So she'd been studying them, and... They had them do some fMRI techniques, fMRI studies, and they'd have them recall their spatial navigation, and it showed some changes in the hippocampus, the hippocampus being active in the posterior part when they were doing the spatial navigation. And so they were interested in whether there was a structural brain difference between taxi drivers and just regular folks. So they did this original study. Here, by the way, is this complex map of London that the taxi drivers have to learn takes three to four years, and it has a special name. It's called Acquiring the Knowledge to Learn This, and not everybody can do it. 
So back then it was a pretty revolutionary idea. It makes sense today. But they took 16 male taxi drivers who learned the knowledge, acquired the knowledge. They used MRI techniques, manually tracing the hippocampus and using voxel-based morphometry to see if there was a difference between taxi drivers and regular folks. And lo and behold, the posterior part of the hippocampus, sitting back here, was larger in the taxi drivers than the controls. This area is called the posterior hippocampal place. The controls had larger anterior hippocampal volumes, and the years of experience for being a taxi driver correlated with the volume of the hippocampus. That was pretty interesting at the time and pretty revolutionary. <coughs> You're using this relatively newer technique, MRI, to measure a change in the brain and associate it with a particular skill. And that, by the way, is important. If you have an MRI change and it doesn't correlate with behavior, we're not sure what that means. But this correlated with their behavior. So this suggests that experience can change the structure of your brain. Unfortunately, because this study was cross-sectional, retrospective, there's a real chicken or an egg problem here. You don't know if people who learn to become a taxi driver got bigger posterior hippocampus or whether you had a big posterior hippocampus to begin with and therefore you became a taxi driver because you had that skill and ability. So it's cross-sectional, it's not perspective, so not sure what that means. But it suggested something, which is we now have the methodology and technology to really correlate brain structure and function in adults. The suggestion was that learning, however, was represented in the brain structure. And actually, is it really so hard to imagine that changes in things that we learn every day doesn't have some kind of structural representation in our brain? It's really not such a far-fetched idea. So since then, there have been many, many, many hundreds of studies that correlate cognitive skill or ability with brain structure. So we know that the hippocampus and the temporal lobes correlate, the size of that correlates with memory performance. We know that people who learn to be and become professional musicians, they have differences in their brain volume compared to people who don't play music. We know that people who have special athletic skills have different brain volumes in different areas. Okay, But all of those things are cross-sectional, they're not perspective. So, now 10 years ago, this study was published. And this was, to my knowledge, the first prospective study looking at changes in brain volume as somebody learned and acquired a new skill. I'm not sure why these guys pick jugglers. I have a couple ideas. Anybody here know how to juggle? Okay, it is a complex skill to learn, all right? You've got to learn and integrate a lot of visual it's called the three ball cascade, I think, is what it's called. It takes a lot of skill to learn how to do this, a lot of visual motor kind of integration and things like that. After I read this study a few years ago, my brother-in-law knows how to juggle, and he taught me, and I actually learned for a little bit. I didn't scan myself before and afterwards, but I learned, and it's a complex skill to learn. So these guys are German. They did the study. They took 24 people. They randomized them into two groups, as you should in this kind of perspective work. One group learned to juggle, and the other group didn't do anything. They scanned them before they learned to juggle. They scanned them right when they finished their training, and then they stopped juggling, and the skill declined, and then they scanned them after that. And lo and behold, over time, relative to the people who aren't learning to juggle, if you look at the group level, the jugglers had this increase in gray matter volume using voxel-based morphometry, in this posterior temporal occipital area that is thought to be important for integrating visual information. Okay. Now, they didn't observe this change on an individual level, but at a group level, they're able to demonstrate this change. So prospectively, you learn a skill, your brain volume changes. That was really pretty revolutionary. And it's kind of neat that they use jugglers for whatever reason. So you think, okay, that's interesting. I don't know if I actually believe that or not. 
So how about if somebody else extends this information and replicates it? And they did. Same kind of thing, same kind of finding. Extend the original study, 20 healthy adults. They scan them earlier in the time course rather than just after three months to see if they can demonstrate this change happening earlier and they get the same kind of area that's showing an increase in gray matter volume. Then they extend it to an older population because these folks that they're studying here in these early studies, these are young folks, they're in their 20s, you know, so maybe it's really not any adult brain is plastic. So they now do it, I won't say in an older group because of my age, I'll say in a, in a more mature, relatively more mature group, these aren't youngsters, and they find the same thing. It's not as robust, but they get this activation or this change in volume back in the posterior occipital temporal junction in the same area. They also find some changes in the temporal lobes in the hippocampus as people are learning new information. Gray matter changes, okay? So how about white matter? Can you change and alter white matter? Not just the gray matter. So another group studied jugglers yet again, randomized them to two groups, trained them for six weeks, followed it by no practice. And by the way, this no practice is important because what happens is, is when you stop practicing and the skill drops off, guess what you see in the gray matter volume? It declines and drops off also. So it's not necessarily a purely permanent thing, but it's this measurement that we're actually getting, at least temporarily. So this other group, by the way, people are publishing these things in well-respected journals. This isn't you know, a fly-by-the-night journal that people are publishing these things in, these findings in. Journal of Neuroscience, Nature Neuroscience, I wish I could publish in those journals. Lo and behold, they find changes in fractional anisotropy using diffusion tensor imaging with increased values in that same region where the other groups were finding these increases in gray matter volume. And they decrease over time as people stop juggling and the skill goes away. They get the same gray matter changes there also. So that's really pretty interesting. You learn this complex skill. A bunch of different labs have done this using different techniques, different variations. You can see the changes begin to pop up within seven days, changes gray matter and white matter. As the skill goes away and declines, the MRI changes begin to trail off. So as a neuroscientist, that's really pretty interesting and fascinating. It kind of goes in the face of what I was taught when I was first learning and studying the brain. As a clinician, it's really very interesting because it suggests that maybe we can facilitate recovery from different disease processes or injuries. It really has that potential. So, ever since I started reading this literature, I kept waiting and waiting and waiting for the group who did this original study with the taxi drivers to present some kind of perspective data because they really got this ball going, okay? So I've been waiting and waiting for that information to come out. And lo and behold, a couple years ago, they published a prospective study with these same taxi drivers. Okay? It took them a while to collect the knowledge because they had to study people over three to four years because that's what it takes for them to, quote, acquire the knowledge and learn this. Now, they didn't randomize folks, but they took everybody who came into the program and they studied those who qualified and compared them to the folks who didn't qualify or acquire the knowledge, but they still scanned both groups prospectively over time. And what did they see? They saw this change in increase in volume in the posterior hippocampus. But interestingly enough, their visual memory, not their navigational memory, but their visual memory declined over time. 
So it seemed to suggest there was some cost for this new learning that they acquired. That your brain just doesn't grow in all areas, but that if it grows in one area, maybe there's another area that might decline or not function as well. And there's that same little nice area in the posterior hippocampus where they're getting this change. Left and right, a little bit more on the right. So finally, I was able to smile about these taxi drivers now because you learn to drive a taxi in London. You are successful. You are changing your brain as you do this. You learn to juggle over the weekend. You're changing your brain. <coughs> Pretty interesting. How many? Do we have any medical students here? Okay. So I don't have the study up here, but there was a study that they did with medical students. And it was done in Germany. And the way the medical school works in Germany, you have these breaks in between your classes where you do this massive amount of studying before you take particular exams. It's a little different here than in the States. We have this distinct time period when you did that. And this German group studied the medical students. Okay? And they compared them to other students who were just kind of studying continuously across the board. Guess what they found in the medical students scanning them before this intensive study period and afterwards? Bigger hippocampus. Bigger parietal cortex as they're learning and kind of integrating this information as a group. So <clears throat> this kind of plasticity, as we'll talk about, has been applied now, this kind of methodology, to a lot of different kind of skills and settings. So how quickly can this happen? Jugglers show the change within seven days. Can you measure it actually faster than seven days? So one of the original studies that was done used uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation to the auditory cortex. They did it once a day for five days. They scanned the people before and they scanned them afterwards. And they saw this increase in volume in the primary auditory cortex. Now, when you think about this, you think, well, maybe that's just irritation or inflammation or something like that that's happening from the stimulation. But they had this nice behavioral correlate with it that suggests not only did the gray matter increase, but the speed of the auditory evoked potentials actually increased at the same time also and that those correlated. So it's not just an irritative phenomena. It's an actual change in the functionality and the improvement in the tissue and how it works. So you can actually see that change in five days of doing TMS. Okay, can you see it any faster? Gray matter changes within two hours. So they took 19 subjects. They taught them essentially a new language. So these are English speakers. They taught them to read these Chinese characters that they made up to go with colors. So it's like learning a new language. They study it intensively over two hours. They scan them before and afterwards. And you get this change in the volume back there in the primary, audit, in the primary occipital visual cortex, which is where you should see it. That makes a lot of sense. Now, interestingly enough, you'll notice on some of these MRIs I'm putting up, you also oftentimes see some changes in some areas and you have no idea what that has to do with. I don't know why there's a change in the, <clears throat> in the uh, cerebellum with this task. So sometimes you see these anomalies. But most of the time, you're seeing changes in volume where you would expect to see them, where we correlate these skills. So two hours to change your gray matter, learning a brand new skill. That's pretty quick, and we can measure it with MRI. What about white matter? Okay, Who here has played video games? Come on. Am I the only one? Come on. All right. Video games are bad for you, right? They're no good. You shouldn't play video games. Not necessarily the case. Anybody here ever played a game called Need for Speed? <laughs> yeah, I have. Okay, so this is a car racing game. I love cars. I love driving fast. It's better for me to drive fast in a video game than in real life, but I probably do a little of both. So Need for Speed is a video game where you drive your car, and depending upon the version of the game, you have different tracks that you can drive on. And so what they did was <clears throat> they took a group of subjects, they randomized them into three groups. 
One group, the learning group, did the same track over and over and over again over this training period. And anybody who's played this game knows that as you do this repetitively, you learn the track and you get faster and you get better. But if you do a different track each time over that same time period, you really don't improve your skill because you're not getting that repetition. So they had a group that did the same track, they had a group that did the different track, and they had a group that wasn't doing anything. All right? They scanned them two hours apart using diffusion tensor imaging with the training in between. And they get changes in the hippocampus, anterior and posterior, using diffusion tensor imaging. And these are mean diffusivity values and FA values around that area. So within the same time, two hour time period that you can learn a new language skill, you can change the structure of your brain learning this new visual complex skill. So if your mother ever says to you again, or you ever say to your child, stop playing the video games, they're no good for you, you should pause and think about that because they may actually be developing your brain in some way. So two hours it took to do that. Now what was really interesting about this study besides the fact that they use video games was they did an animal study along with this. So, so far we've been talking about these imaging findings. And you notice all I've said is, well, an increase in the gray volume or an increase in something about the white matter. I haven't said what's actually changing. We don't know what we're actually measuring within those scans. We don't know what that change in volume actually represents, do we? I actually have no idea, even though a couple studies like this have been done. So this is actually really important work. So they try to do the same kind of study with animals. They scan them, the animals, and then of course they sacrifice the animals and look histologically for changes in the brain. So in this study, they're using a water maze. They have a passive control condition, uh, a no learning condition, and then a learning condition where they learn to swim their way out of this water maze and find the tower or find the platform to get out. And essentially what they found is the same kind of thing they found in the humans, who we don't sacrifice, but we just scan. They found the same thing with imaging, and then they found some changes uh, histologically. There's some suggestion that there's a change in the number of synaptic vesicles. Um, maybe BDNF was increased also. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, this was really interesting to me because it seemed to point people in a direction that says, okay, so when we see this change in gray matter volume, we see this change in white matter, what's actually happening there? It's not that we're probably actually growing new neurons, but maybe that there's a support cells or structures associated with the neurons that might be changing that help them function better. So we can change gray matter and white matter within two hours and measure it. So those changes have probably always been there. But now we can actually measure it. We still don't know what we're actually changing, though. And even though there have been some other studies that have been done using water maze tasks, scanning animals, sacrificing them afterwards, in looking at these studies, I really haven't come upon anything that's consistent in the findings. Part of it is because everybody's measuring something a little bit different. It always seems to be something to do with the support cells and structures associated with the neurons. Now this most recent study was actually a little more promising and interesting and it made sense to me because they just looked at essentially diffusion tensor imaging in the animals and then they're just looking at how much myelination is going on because we think DTI, diffusion tensor imaging, looking at fractional anisotropy is measuring essentially the integrity of that white matter which might be myelin based. So this was an interesting task and an interesting study. They took rats, put them in a cage, 
and just through the bars of the cage, they drop a pellet. And in one group, with the preferred paw, they could reach through and actually grab that pellet, find it and grab it. So they're teaching them a reaching and grabbing task that's successful. So when you're doing that with one hand, you're actually using the other hemisphere. Okay? With the other paw, they would have an opportunity to do that and see the pellet, but were never successful. So it's a little cruel, but they could never actually get that pellet. Periodically, they just reinforced them, but it was not through the success of that skill. Right? So they're looking at animals who are successful and unsuccessful, who get the training, don't get the training, and they're looking between hemispheres. And they found this difference between hemispheres. So the hemisphere that is contralateral to the paw that's learning actually shows this increase in myelination, increase in FA value. The other hemisphere that's unsuccessful is not changing, and the animals who are not trained don't show any changes either. And then through staining the white matter, they suggest it's really, for whatever reason, you're increasing the myelination that happens. And of course, it correlates with how well they learned. And this is a really important point, because if you only change the volume of the brain and it doesn't correlate with the behavior, we really have no idea what we're doing. This is really important supportive information, and the good studies that are done, you get that correlation and that change. So it's pretty specific by hemisphere, it's pretty specific by location, and it correlates with change. And it seems to suggest there's an increase in the myelination. But we really don't have a good answer yet. MRI does not have the kind of resolution in humans that we need to have to really drill down and understand what we're actually measuring. This blob of gray matter that we're seeing increase, we still don't really know what, what that is. The change in the white matter using diffusion tensor imaging, maybe we're a little farther along in understanding that it has to do with the myelination. Okay, so let me talk briefly about a couple other clinical studies that are interesting. So then taking the same methodology and applying it to patients, what can you see? Okay, schizophrenia chronic disease. It is not treated. It is managed with medication. You have schizophrenia. You have it for life. There's a group that put folks through a two-year training program that worked on cognitive rehabilitation and social skill training that showed improved functional status, scanned them pre and post. Granted, there's a lot of stuff intervening there. They showed some increase in brain volume and then less decrease in brain volume over time compared to a control group. So with schizophrenia, you lose brain volume over time relatively more rapidly than in normals. And so this intervention appeared to stave off the loss of brain tissue and maybe increase brain tissue some in a chronic managed but untreatable disease. That's interesting. Anybody here know anything about mindful meditation? Okay. This is a hot topic in psychology and psychiatry. It's used a lot now for treating various disorders. There was actually a recent study within the last couple of years in the Green Neurology Journal using mindfulness with MS patients and showing a good outcome with them. So what happens if you take mindful meditation and you apply it? In this case, it was just to controls. You show these huge increases in areas of the brain that are typically associated with things like meditation, posterior cingulate cortex, which is probably part of the default mode network. How about if you just give a bolus of dopamine? What happens to the brain? You can actually measure the change where you would expect to measure it. Change in brain volume from a single dose of dopamine. So when you're administering dopamine to Parkinson's patients, there's an alteration that we can now measure in the brain as a group. Chronic pain. When you think of chronic pain patients, what do you think of? Do you think about their brain? Not typically. There are known changes in the brain with groups of patients with chronic pain. We've done a little bit of that work. 
what happens when you treat them with cognitive behavior therapy, teach them how to manage and cope with their pain, you get changes in the frontal cortex in the patients who learn how to manage and control their pain just using psychological techniques. That's pretty interesting. That's pretty powerful. We know it works behaviorally, but we can actually measure that change in these patients now. What if you take older subjects and train them how to improve their memory? You get a change in the white matter of the brain in the anterior part of the brain. The same group doing the same kind of training, you get an increase in gray matter, particularly cortical thickness in the right insular part of the brain. So taking patients, older patients who are developing memory problems, putting them through a cognitive training protocol, you can actually measure an alteration in their brain structure. That correlates with the change in their behavior. And this is a pretty interesting study I came across as I was uh, preparing for this talk. So they took patients with Parkinson's disease and they gave them balance training. And they measured a change and an improvement in increasing the volume of the cerebellum to help them compensate as they learn how to manage their balance. That's really pretty interesting. So you're actually getting that correlation, that, that you're getting that increase in an area of the brain that makes sense that helps them compensate and, and improve their balance and their functioning. That's pretty interesting stuff. So taxi drivers and jugglers are interesting, okay? But now you can take this and you can apply it to patient populations. So <clears throat> at this point, I have a collection of over 60 prospective studies using MRI that measure change in outcome. Anything and everything you can think about, people are studying this. We still don't know what we're changing. We haven't been able to determine how long it lasts and if it's permanent over time. And then here's my question. If we're really changing our brain that much for everything we do, so as you guys are sitting here right now, the structure of your brain is changing, how come our brains don't get so big that our heads explode? I don't understand that. Something's happening, but we don't really fully understand it at all. So I want to end up here by <clears throat> talking about a study that we've done at West Virginia looking at this phenomena of brain plasticity in adults. And what we sought to do was study something that we thought would be pretty easy to do, get some data on it that clinical patients could use and follow through on. It wasn't too time intensive, so patients would follow and adhere to it. So what we studied was an attention training protocol that I use. This is a protocol that I use with my clinical patients to help them with their memory problems and their general cognitive problems. I teach them how to improve their attention, so we applied this to a clinical population. We studied 12 healthy young folks who got the attention training, and then we have seven folks who didn't get the attention training at this point. We did pre and post MRI scanning using structural high resolution anatomical images diffusion tensor imaging, and resting state functional MRI. We assessed their cognition before and afterwards, and we had them practice 20 minutes a day is all, 10 out of 14 days a week. So that's uh, 200 minutes of training is all they got. So here's the task. It's an MBAC task is what we train them on. So what you do is they take a deck of cards and they turn the deck of cards over one at a time. And the end back task varies in its complexity based upon what you're doing. If it's a zero back task, you just say the card that's right there. If it's a one back task, you take this card, you turn it over, take this card, turn it over, place it on top, and then you have to remember this card going one back. For two back, you place this card, this card, this card. Once you place this card, you have to remember two back. So you'd say three of hearts, queen of spades, ace of spades. These are covered up. And after you say that second card, then you have to go back and say three of hearts. Then you say queen of clubs, and you have to remember queen of spades, nine of spades, and so forth. So we have them work on these end back tasks with increasing complexity up to three back, which is pretty complicated. 
most of the time I struggle with three back myself. Okay. Now, in addition to just practicing this task, we taught them what we think is most important, two principles. So when they're practicing these tasks, their goal is just to use the task to notice when their mind is wandering off to something else other than the cards. And when it wanders, they're supposed to grab it and bring it back. All right? So it's really all about keeping your attention on the task at hand. It's not so much how hard the task is, but the harder the task gets, it keeps people interested. So it's really all about being aware of when your attention is on and when it's off. So your mind wanders it as I'm speaking. You're supposed to notice that, grab it, and bring it back. Because that's what really improves your attention, I think. I don't think you build your attention muscle by working harder, but it's really using the resources you have and keeping your mind on what you're doing. Does that make sense? So that's what we train people on. So of the 12 subjects, three were that got the attention training. Three were excluded. One, because occasionally when we scan normal subjects, there's something wrong with their brain, and there was something wrong with this person's brain. So we excluded her from the analysis. Uh, fortunately, it was probably a developmental abnormality, so she didn't have to have uh, somebody like Dr. Bowling go in and do anything. Then we had two people who didn't improve. So we measured their performance on this task to begin with, and then after the two weeks. And that's how we measured compliance, essentially. Because if you don't improve on the task, you're not doing it, or you're not doing it right. So we had two people who didn't get better. So we ended up with nine people in the training group, compared them to seven controls. These nine people got better. These seven controls, we just brought them in, scanned them, test them, sent them away for two weeks, brought them back. Okay, these are young folks in this case, well-educated, above average in terms of their intelligence. So, obviously, their end back performance improved substantially over the training period because that's what puts them in the group. But we measured other things about their attention that we, they didn't practice on. We, and the no treatment group didn't change at all. They are dead even the same. Their digit span, which is another measure of attention that they didn't train on, improved over time. <clears throat> didn't change in the other group. And then a complex working memory task called the self-order pointing task, we're measuring the number of errors that they make. Those errors decrease in a reliable manner whereas in the no treatment group, they stayed unchanged. So it looks like we trained them to improve their attention. They certainly improved on the tasks we trained them on, which makes sense. But on other measures that are unrelated, except they require attention, over a two-week period, 20 minutes a day, 200 minutes in total, your attention actually got better. That's important because the training and intervention actually worked. So a little bit about the imaging analysis that we did. We did resting state fMRI analysis. We used a combination of FSL and AFNI, and we looked at the dorsal attention network. For diffusion tensor imaging, we hand drew ROIs in the genuine and the splenium of the corpus callosum. We didn't do voxel-based work because I think our sample was a little too small, and I was worried about the specificity of that. And then we measured the structure of the brain in two ways, doing tensor-based morphometry and SPM8, and then using FreeSurfer to measure cortical thickness and using their longitudinal analysis pipeline. So what did we find? We see a change in improvement in the dorsal attention network. It's more focused and more intense in terms of the activation. That makes sense. What do we see in terms of their diffusion tensor imaging? Here's an example of the ROIs that we drew in the genu and the splenium. We're very reliable in how we do these, by the way. The drawings, you're blind to all the scans, so you don't know who they are. You don't know what's pre or post. You're just drawing the ROIs. And we see a change in the genu over treatment. That's not a reliable difference, but it's a little bit of a decline in the controls but an increase in the genu in the treatment group. Using voxel-based morphometry, 
we get this change in the posterior part of the hippocampus and in the frontal lobe. And this frontal lobe area kind of extends out and is part of the corpus callosum. It bleeds into that area from here. It's also a very important area for working memory in general. And then with the cortical thickness, we get this change in the insula. Look familiar. Very similar area to what they got when they're training the uh, memory skills for the older adults. We get this cuneus, precuneus area back there, which is important for working memory also. We get a little lateral temporal change in cortical thickness also. It's important to say that for all these MRI measures, we never got a change in the other direction. So there was never an area where the controls showed an increase over time relative to this group. It's only a positive finding for the training group. So it's less likely this is a spurious finding. It's still possible because we have a small end, but it's less likely. And we got a little bit of a trend here also. I'm a little less confident in this area. So what about structure function relationship? So for every one of our MRI measures, it correlates with the change in their behavioral performance. So the change in the default mode correlates with the improvement in the end back, and it correlates with the change in FA and the genu. The change in the FA and genu correlates with the change in the end back performance in their training and the change in the digit span performance. Gray matter changes in the hippocampus change correlate with the change in end back performance, and it correlates. The genu change correlates with that area in the middle frontal cortex only. And then the change in the insular cortical thickness, which was our most reliable change, also correlates and positively changes with the change in MBAC performance. So we seem to have this change in brain structure that goes along with and changes with the change in behavior. So behavior, function, and structure are changing together. So to me, this is important because this is a really pretty brief training protocol, isn't it? You can convince most people to give you 20 minutes a day for two weeks. It's actually less than that, 200 minutes over two weeks. That's not a lot of time investment. We actually see an improvement in their attention, and it's altering their brain structure. That's really pretty interesting. And to me, it's important because it's clinically usable and practical. All right? 20 minutes a day, that's what it takes. All right? Name a disorder in psychiatry or neurology that doesn't have attention problems. Attention deficits are a primary core deficit with all diseases of the brain, whether they're neurological or psychiatric. So it's applicable to just about any population, MS, stroke, head injury, ADHD, of course, anxiety disorders, depression, epilepsy. They all have attention problems. You've got a brief protocol that can improve their functioning and maybe alter their brain. So about our conclusions, I'm still tentative because I'm still a little hesitant. But we have some overlap with the findings of other groups, and there's a little bit of consistency between our methods for doing this and finding these things. So what do we want to do? So with our study, we didn't do random assignment. And that's because when we first did this, it was really a proof of principle design. So we just studied the 12 people who got the attention training, once we saw an effect within, within them, then we collected control data to make sure that that data was different, so that there was no different in that group. So we need to replicate this with random assignment. And we're work working on and just starting collecting the data on two different groups. One is patients with small vessel ischemic disease who have mild cognitive impairment. 
In West Virginia, we have high rates of diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. They run rampant. Lots of people have this. It's very applicable for our state. And then also in MS, because they have a lot of attention problems, and we have a good program for MS patients so we can get access to those folks. We're developing a web-based protocol so that people can log on to the web and do the attention training on the web, and we can actually measure their performance web-based. We know what their compliance is, and we can measure their change in behavior very easily without them bringing them into our lab to do this. They can do it at home. And then we've also developed the mindfulness protocol. I don't know if you remember, but in that mindfulness study, most programs that teach you mindfulness, they teach you over eight weeks, hours a day, and like a full day on Saturday once or twice. It is an intensive training program. I'm not going to go do that. That's not how I learn mindfulness. I'm not going to invest that time. You're not going to get most patients to do that. So we came up with a slimmed down version of 20 minutes a day for seven days that we're going to apply to patients also. <clears throat> so what we hope to end up with ultimately is study and develop a series of tasks that may change and alter the structure in different parts of the brain. Have a menu of things for patients to choose from based upon their interest and ability that they can use to improve their functioning and alter their brain. And eventually maybe target different populations who have different problems in different parts of the brain with specific protocols that may change and alter those brain areas, ultimately. I don't know if we'll get to that or not. And that's it. Yes? Thank you. I uh, think this is a monumentally important issue. And uh, I'd like to point out that with PubMed, we, that we can get relatively obsessed with recent literature, because if you do a search and you find 10 pages of 20 papers each, few people will go back more than two years. So Marion Diamond and Mark Rosenzweig at UC Berkeley did basically everything in rats. And they showed rats in enriched environment have more neurons, more synapses, more dendrites, more arborization, more blood flow, more proteins, larger neurons, and of course not with MRI or DTI. Right. But they, they showed that the structure and function of the brain is directly dependent upon what we do. Correct. And clinically, it's, it's an enormous problem as you mentioned Particularly, I always ask my patients and families, what do they like to do when they're not working? And it's a, the conclusion is many people, of course, not everybody, but many people, they have absolutely nothing. They don't have right. any hobbies. They don't have any recreational activities. If they're not working, they're watching television or they're reading the Courier Journal, which is not a very intense <laughs> And my approach is I want to find out enough about them so it can be personalized because I really, I have no faith that I'm ever going to get my patients to do something. I tell them you should do this right. and they'll do it for a week or two, but for the, what, we, what we need, as you should point out, they have to do it continually. They can't just do it for two weeks and then stop. Right. So I try to find something about them, about their history, something that they can find interest in and encourage them, go, go ahead and do that. Go to a church group or learn to sing or continue singing or just do something that involves learning. Right, right. So, yeah, you made a couple good points here, and, and you're right. There, are, there is an animal literature that goes way back that shows plasticity in animals. Um, and so my focus has really been on this more recent application to humans where we can measure it using MRI. But there is a larger literature with animals that goes back. And then the point about individualizing, a lot of people will come up to me and they say, oh, so should I do crossword puzzles? I heard crossword puzzles will make sure I don't get Alzheimer's disease. And I say, the first thing I say to them, I say, do you like crossword puzzles? And if they say no, I say, well, then don't do it because you're going to try to do it. You're not going to like it and you're not going to follow through. Okay. So what do you like to do? If they tell me something they like to do, 
And we try to find something that's a variation of that where they have to learn something new. It's something they like that they'll comply with and adhere to, and we can vary it and they'll get the, we'll get the compliance, and it still involves new learning. It seems to be that it's important to have some new aspect to it, but you have to hook it into them or they're not going to do it. I think that's important. I agree. Yes? Mark, thinking about what is enlarging the cortex in these different regions, um, there, there could be a, a, a different sort of mechanism for cortical enlargement in different regions. And a lot of this is going back to the hippocampus. And I'm thinking that it is well known that the dentate gyrus, there is a postnatal neurogenesis uh, that, that that does occur in, in the dentate gyrus. And so, so in fact, it's possible that there could be new neurons, uh, particularly in, in the dentate gyrus. Yeah, it, it's, it's certainly possible, although, you know, I tr when, I, when I read this stuff and I, and I do this work, I get really excited. And, and I try to remain, when I get so excited, I try to remain a little bit skeptical about it because I want to question this and I want to make sure we're really, this is something we're really finding and, you know, I want to be a good scientist about it. So part of me gets excited and says, yeah, we're growing neurons. This is what's happening. But I remain a little bit more skeptical about that. There was a recent study that I, I didn't include here that really did a nice job of tracking changes in cortical thickness and, and folding also uh, with intelligence longitudinally over time. That's a pretty recent study that I've got to look more at that may actually speak to some of this also. Also, because when you think about it, if you're getting a change in the folding, that's really a different process than just measuring an increase in the gray blob. It says that you're changing the complexity of the tissue and how that tissue is actually working also. And that might be interesting work also to see what happens with that. Yes? Um, so I was interested um, where you had shown, you said that you learn a skill, there are changes that you see, um, and then when you sort of stop performing that skill, that these changes tend to disappear. Has anyone looked to see if there's like a time dependent, sort of, if it's time dependent, for example, you learn a skill for a short time, does that seem to disappear faster than you learn a skill for years? So. These kind of definitive studies on timeline really haven't been done. So it's just this kind of, you know, we should look at this and see what happens when the skill declines over a period of time, and they find that. But they really haven't done as much work looking at that change and decrease and what factors into that. There's a little bit of data that the time course and change differs between whether you're measuring gray or white tissue, gray matter tissue or white matter, okay? There's some suggestion there's a difference in the curve between them and how they change, in the steepness of how it changes initially and how it changes over time. But definitive studies to kind of map that out clearly have not been done. You know, at this point, people are still like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Let's do this. Let's do this. And they really haven't had a chance to systematically and kind of parametrically look at some of those kind of things. I know you had a question. <laughs> I have two questions. First question is, as you showed in that taxi driver uh, study, the, where they found that there's an increase in the posterior hippocampus, but they lose the visual thing. And I know this is a study for a long time, for three to four years. And whatever other, stu other studies you have shown are the short time period where they didn't see any deficit in any other task. So is it like if you're learning a technique for a very long period of a time, you can lose some of your other skill as they talk about? Maybe because uh, um, you are getting more inputs out there, which is enlarging that area and which will affect the. So what's I mean, that could about be, it? It could be you're not doing the other skill now and it's declining. So that could be part of that phenomena there that you, because you're concentrating so much on this, you're not doing this other thing. And that's how, you know, kind of the brain balances itself out so your head doesn't explode because it doesn't keep growing and growing. I mean, so that may be, if you're doing more of this, this is declining. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these studies don't do a double dissociation, which is really nice scientifically to say, okay, we expect to see this change, and then we expect to see this decline or this not change. Um, and so... Adding that piece to these studies would be important. 
The taxi driver studies, this, this group that does that work, they've, there's a lot of other studies I didn't present on the taxi drivers. They looked at bus drivers who look, just drive a straight line back and forth, and you know they don't show these kind of changes, and they looked at this and that. So they do, they do careful work like that, and they found this change in the anterior part of the hippocampus, this decline in this part, and this in, improvement in another part, and that kind of work is important. And, and I have to say, in retrospect, we didn't do that in our study. We didn't say, okay, we need a double dissociation here. We need to be very careful scientifically. And so those studies are still happening, actually. And the other question I have is um, the study which you have shown about the attention thing, that uh -huh. the, those are done with all the young and the persons who are healthy, right? And right. we want to use that in the patients who right. are having these cognitive problems. Right. Uh, do you aware of any study done with any of those ones, or this is the first one which will come up? No. Um, there, are, there are studies uh, with patients with mild cognitive impairment for Alzheimer's disease that show an improvement in the skills. The MRI studies haven't been quite done. There are other patient populations that have they've done this with. I've done it individually, you know, in terms of clinical treatment with older folks, and I get some success, so I might expect to see it. So there's a little bit of data out there with clinical populations. So, you know, to me, if you can do it with schizophrenia, I mean, working with patients with schizophrenia is a challenge. To, and, you know, and so they can do that in schizophrenia. It's a noisy study because it's a two-year time period. You don't know what else is happening in that two-year time period. You know, when you're studying, when, even when we're studying people over the course of two weeks, we're, we can't control everything else that they're learning during that time. It may be that the group that got assigned to the treatment, they happen to be learning computer programming also at that same time and didn't tell us about it, you know. So, you know, it's hard to control those kind of things. Because the thing is that, you know, in a healthy patient, you have all circuitry which is working, and it's easy to get that. But... In these cognitive patients, they already have some kind of deficits, which could be in neurogenesis, which could be in other kind of, they are losing their neurons in that part of the brain. So to get the similar kind of results, is that's why I was asking about, is these kinds of studies have been done and there There's, is There is a little bit of data with clinical populations who have neurological insults. There's a little bit of data. And it may well differ, but depending upon the nature of their injury, whether it's a single traumatic event, whether it's from a traumatic brain injury or it's from a stroke, that may be very different than a, than a process that has essentially been there for a long time, like we think Alzheimer's has been, and then starts to express itself uh, in terms of the change in your brain and then express itself clinically. You know, the change in an Alzheimer's happened to your brain well before you have the clinical symptoms. And so dealing with and combating that may be very different than a single blow to the head. idea of a frivolous remark, but I was wondering if you... Hey, I talked about jugglers, so <laughs> nothing's frivolous. If you were going to look, at, one were going to look at a map of London for three years and try to memorize that whole capillary of network, I wonder if it doesn't affect one visually. <laughs> yeah, but it's not just studying that map the whole time. They're actually driving it, too, so they have to learn that knowledge. So, But that's possible. I hadn't thought about that. Well, Mark, thank you very much. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.